بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع هداهم بإحسان إلى مدين So today inshallah we are covering ayat 23 to 29 from Surah Al-Isra and they deal with actually two very strongly related subjects they deal with ihsan from the perspective of treating one's family, starting with one's parents, but then moving on to kin. But interweaved with that, there is also the concept of ihsan in the form of how we spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually, I still remember when I was little, uh, one of the uh, reading classes was just those verses, the first three verses uh, about uh, how to honor one's parents and treat them well. And I remember it was a very gripping uh, class because I felt it was not just some random reading subject, but it was very, very relevant to each one of us. Every one of us has parents. And whether our parents are alive or have passed away, we have a way to honor them. So without further ado, I want to begin. And I've uh, chosen today the Sahih International Translation as the one I'm showing, but I will stray from it a little bit. As we explain the words, sometimes I'm going to use alternate words for the, uh, the Arabic. With Ayah 23, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins with, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانَ إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْتٍ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا And your Lord has decreed, it starts with and, because before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Tawheed, the ayah before Allah is talking about Tawheed, and Allah is adding to Tawheed this ayah. And it's very interesting how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doubling down on Tawheed. Allah has decreed, or your Lord has decreed, that you should worship none but He, and you should honor your parents. And the uh, Mufassirin always point out how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has associated worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with honoring one's parents. And to be very precise, bilwalidayni ihsana means to treat them well or to treat them in an excellent manner. Ma'roof would be to treat them well and ihsan is to treat them in an excellent manner. In, in an excellent manner. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins with وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ Your Lord has decreed. It is a decree. It is a decision from Allah. It is a judgment from Allah that you should only worship Him, but also you should honor your parents or you should treat them in the best manner possible. Now, treating one's parents well is easy sometimes, but sometimes it is difficult, which gets us to the next part of the ayah. Whether one of them or both of them reach an old age, do not tell them off and do not push them aside or do not mistreat them or do not repel them and tell them honorable words. You can translate it as honorable words or as noble words. They both convey the same meaning. So it's easy for all of us to treat our parents well when everything is nice, but sometimes things get difficult. In particular, when parents get older and they become more needy, they are physically needy, they, they physically need more support from us, but also perhaps they don't go to work every day, so they need more of our time. Sometimes as people get older, they become, you know, or at least they appear to be more difficult to work with or more difficult to communicate with. And part of it is them, but part of it is us. As we get older and we become more independent, we feel less dependent on our parents. Some of us give ourselves the right to cross line with our parents. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us never to do that. Whether one of them reaches old age, whether one of them is infirm or needy, or both, do not tell them off. And off is the least form of mistreat them. You say, in English, you don't say off, but you say like that, just the F. Okay, and sometimes you roll your eyes, but they add up to the same thing. What is what it is, it is an expression of contempt. Now, the Mufassirun, 
uh, many of them, they will tell you Allah is beginning with the lowest level of mistreatment of the parents. And certainly, oh, it's far, far uh, less severe than what comes next, which is wala tanharhuma, do not repel them. Nahr is not repelled, by the way, the translation is probably choosing the, the closest English word. Tanharhuma is when you mistreat them. For example, you raise your voice to them. That's not. You, uh, you talk down to them. Uh, you, uh, uh, you tell them you shouldn't have done this. Why did you do that? That's not. Right? You're basically misspeaking to them. So Allah is beginning with the lower and the higher. But as a parent myself, I can tell you, even when your child so much as rolls his eyes or rolls her eyes, that kills you. You feel you know so much love for them and you've invested so much of yourself in them not just your time and your effort you've invested so much of your love and your heart in them you're not expecting from them to treat you the same way but you're expecting from them at least some recognition or at the very least that there would not be any contempt so do not tell them so much as oh and do not mistreat them and say to them honorable words or honorable speech noble words or noble speech. So not only you should treat them well, but also you should choose the words that they like. And subhanAllah, it's not a very difficult thing. It's as much as picking up the phone and calling your mother when she's not expecting it. It's as much as expressing how delighted you are with their visits when they come. And definitely one thing that has seeped into our culture here in the United States is this idea of disrespecting or at least looking down at people when they get older. People talk about old geezers. We Muslims, we don't see things this way. People say, oh, I hate the holidays, you know, spending time with family. We take a very different perspective. We see it as a way to reconnect with the people who are closest to us. So say to them noble words, honorable words, beautiful words, the kind of words you would want to hear from your children. وَاخْفِدْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ this ayah is so beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an analogy. It's a metaphor actually. And lower for them the wing of humility out of mercy. And say, O oh my Lord, have mercy on them as they have brought me up when I was young or when I was small. So the first part of the ayah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the analogy of mercy being like a bird and you are lowering your wing and if you see a uh, uh, a pigeon taking care of its young in the nest you'll see that the bird is actually gathering its wings down to protect its children that's one way to see the metaphor also when you see a bird that is in fear of being attacked you will see that it will be on the ground with its wings on the ground almost like ready to run, ready to take off, but not quite ready to run and take off at this moment, doesn't know what to do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about this mercy. And then he says, lower for them the wing of humility. The translation says humility, but actually dhul does not mean humility. Dhul means humiliation. In other words, you not only go to the point of humility with your parents, you go a step beyond that. My father used to say, Rahimahullah, if, and he loved his mother very, very much, and his mother never did anything to, uh, uh, to upset him because she loved him very much. But he said, if my mother hit me in front of my friends, I have no choice but to say, yes, mother. So you don't even think of somehow elevating yourself above your parents, even if it comes to the point of humiliation, even if it comes to the point of being embarrassed, you still lower that wing to your parents, all the way down to humiliation. And I looked at actually several translations. Translating it to humility is very popular. I suppose because in English, the word humiliation is harsh. While the word zul in Arabic is not, you know, does not have the same uh, impact. In context, when you say lower the wing of zul out of mercy, it works in Arabic better than it works in English. That's my guess why they translate it as humility. And say, oh my Lord, have mercy of the, on them as they have raised me as a child. So in this ayah, there are several values that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of. One of them is loyalty and recognition, which the 
the, the, the greater value here is gratefulness. You are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you are grateful to your parents for what they have done. Now, perhaps they are older. Perhaps you don't have the time to spend with them like they had with you, but you always make dua for them. And don't come to the point where somehow you look down upon them. Same, our Lord, have mercy on them just as they raised me as a child. And subhanAllah, when you think what parents do when they raise their children, it's incredible mercy what they do for the children. They don't do for anybody. Allah put in our fitrah something that is compelling. So much so that when a parent does not take care of a child, we say, they're not human. How could they do that? So Allah gave us this fitrah inside us to take care of our children. We say that Allah has given to every child two parents whom he has enslaved for the child. If the child needs them to stay up, they'll stay up. If the child needs them to run to the store to get something, they will run. If the child needs them to take him to the hospital, they will take him. And when the child is well, if he's hungry, they will feed him. If he has to move, they'll carry him. If he has to be changed, they'll change him. They'll do everything for him. And they will complain and say, I didn't sleep last night and all that. But they will still, they will still have the drive inside them to do everything for the child. But the reverse is not true. When the child grows up, they can't find it in themselves to do for their parents as much as the parents did for them, at least in most cases. It's very difficult to do it because this is the, the you know, the fitrah, this is the, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us, that we are compelled to be there for our children. So Allah is reminding us of what our parents have done to us. Just picture with me for a moment. The mother who's looking at her child, maybe he's newborn, maybe he's two years old, and she is seeing in his eyes the hope of the world. She's seeing in his eyes his future. She's seeing in his eyes that he will be fit and strong and healthy and successful. She's seeing so many beautiful things, and she's willing to sacrifice everything she has for the child to attain that. She will sacrifice her career. She will sacrifice her job. She will sacrifice many things in life, certainly her sleep, certainly her money, for that child to attain when you think of that moment and how the parents look at the child, that should evoke in us that desire to invoke mercy for our parents. We should feel compelled to be there for our parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajeem, Rabbukum a'lamu bima fi nufusikum. In takunu salihina fa innahu kana lil awwabina wakura. Allah knows best that which is within yourselves. Allah knows your feelings. Allah knows you battling yourself in the specific meaning here related to the previous ayah when it's difficult for you to honor your parents but you do it anyway. Allah knows that, that you're struggling with it. And Allah appreciates that you're struggling with it. But at the same time, you can take it in the general meaning. So as a rule of tafsir is that an ayah is not confined to the occasion of revelation. So the more general perspective is that in general, whenever you're struggling with anything in yourself, Allah knows what is in your heart. Allah knows what you're intending. If you're intending something wicked, Allah knows it. And if you're intending something good, Allah knows it. And if you're struggling, but you exercise taqwa and you do the right thing in the end, Allah knows and appreciates and rewards. And if you're struggling and you weaken, but you feel bad about your weakness, then Allah knows it. And this is referenced very directly in the second part of the ayah. So Allah knows best what is in your hearts, or technically it's not your hearts, that which is within your chest or that which is within yourselves. If you should be righteous, then Allah is most forgiving to the awabin. The translation here is very nice, the oft returning. That's a, a, a spot on translation for awabin, but perhaps it needs a little explanation of returning in what way. Al awabin are described in three ways, but all of them are related, three facets of the same thing. Those who are frequently engaging in salah. Secondly, 
those who are frequently engaging in the remembrance of Allah. And thirdly, those who often return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in seeking forgiveness. And some of the Musasirin specifically say that the awabin, one of the one of the categories that fall under awabin, those who sin and repent and sin and repent and sin and repent. When they sin, they sin out of weakness. And when they repent, they repent out of iman. They are, even though they make many mistakes, they are not satisfied with themselves making those mistakes. So they don't accept that the sin is all right. They just keep on repenting. They fall in the sin, they keep on repenting. Allah is most forgiving or oft forgiving for such people. So Allah knows what's in your hearts. And if you are righteous, then Allah easily forgives those who frequently return to Him. Now Allah moves to a different facet of Ihsan, which is uh, 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 supporting one another. It is mutual support. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَآتِي ذَا الْقُرْبَ حَقَّهُ وَالْمِسْكِينَ وَابْنَ السَّبِيلِ وَلَا تُبَذِّرْ تَبْغِيرًا Give the one who is near or the relative. The qurba is the relative, specifically blood relatives, but also marriage relatives. Ati the qurba haqqa. Give the relative their due, their right. Well, miskin, the needy person. The translation says poor, that will work too. But it's really the needy person. Wabna sabid, and the traveler. Wala to bad and do not spend wastefully. So Allah here is directing us to spend from our wealth in the ways that please Him. And to spend in our wealth first for those who are kin, then for those who are needy, then for those who are traveling, and then we should not be wasteful. Now let's take these one by one. Ati the qurba those who are kin. The Messenger explicitly says that the best sadaqah that is spent is on those who are closest. So you cannot pay your zakah to a person for whom you are financially responsible. A father cannot give his zakah to his child because he's financially responsible for the child. But the but a father or a, a person can give his zakah to his cousins, he can give his zakah to just relatives for whom he's not financially responsible. Not only is it right, it is best. So when you give to those who are closest, it is best. But what about the sadaqat? What about the additional money? Beyond the care, it's not limited. So if your child is in need of financial help and you give your child because he's in need of financial help, that is better than giving the neighbor. And giving the neighbor is better. Well, first, giving the, your cousin. And giving cousin is better than the neighbor and the neighbor is better than the stranger. And the stranger who's in town is better than the one who is you know, in another town. So the closer, the better. As for the traveler, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in other places as well. A person may be well, he might not be miskeen, he might not be needy in general. He might be well off. But as he is traveling, he is displaced. I'm sure most of us, since now we live at a time where travel happens frequently, most of us at least have at least once experienced this experience where you're traveling and it's tough and you're really tired and somebody is generous with you or kind with you, somebody invites you to your home, you know, gives you a warm meal, and you feel especially grateful at that point, even though you could afford it yourself. But just the, the weariness of travel makes it so that when a person takes care of you in this situation, it's really worth so much more. And then Allah says, وَلَا تُبَذِّرْ تَبْذِيرًا And do not be wasteful. Now, وَلَا تُبَذِّرْ تَبْذِيرًا is understood in two ways. One in line with what was said before, which is spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but don't spend in a way that is wasteful. When is it wasteful? When I give to something that is lower priority. For example, I gave the neighbor when in my home there is a need. I gave the stranger when my relative is in need. That would be wasteful. But actually, the more general understanding here of wastefulness is that which is not pleasing to Allah. So Allah is saying, spend in charity and don't waste your money on things that displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's not telling you spend less on charity, but he's, he's saying spend less on the things that take away from charity, which is, you know, you, wa you waste your money on just anything that is not useful. 
You spend too much money on your car. You spend too much money on luxuries. You spend too much money on going out to restaurants. And if it's taken away from something that's higher priority, it becomes wastefulness. And Allah explains it. إِنَّ الْمُبَذِّرِينَ كَانُوا إِخْوَانَ الشَّيَاطِينَ وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِرَبِّهِ كَفُورًا Indeed, the wasteful people are the brethren of the devils. And وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِرَبِّهِ كَفُورًا And shaitan has always been ungrateful to his Lord. So Allah here is giving us two important meanings. The first is that when you are wasteful, you are a companion or a brother to the devils. Because where are you spending your money? You're not spending it where it is most needed. You're not spending it to those who are providing things that are most needed. You're actually promoting the economy, the wrong economy. You're not promoting people who are doing things that are productive. You're promoting an economy that is less productive. So you are actually helping bring down the, the, your society. But then Allah also says, وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِرَبِّهِ Your shaitan has been ungrateful to his Lord. Allah is giving, uh, uh, pointing us to a very important uh, uh, mistake that we make. People become wasteful when they are ungrateful for what they have. When you are grateful for what you have, you'll be careful with every uh, dollar that is gets spent in a way that pleases Allah. When you are grateful for the time that you have, the free time that you have, you will not waste it. You will be grateful for it by spending that free time in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not just wasting it. So when you are being wasteful, you are being kafur, you are being ungrateful. This is obviously not kufrul millah, not the kind of kufr that takes you outside of Islam, but the kufr of ungratefulness. You are ungrateful for the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you waste them. People say, easy come, easy go. And it's well known that people who win a lot of money in lottery, they end up losing most of the time, literally more than half of the time, they end up bankrupt within any time within the first three years. Because not only they spent everything they had, but they got a big house and mortgages and loans and everything. And they imagined in their minds that they are going to make investments and just keep on making more and more money. But since they're not trained to spend that money well, it ends up being lost. And people refer to the concept of new money versus old money. Now, I'm not here to claim that people with old money are better or anything like this. But I will say that when money has been earned over a long period of time, people appreciate it. And when they win it very easily and very quickly, they don't know what to do with it. So they just engage in luxuries. And if you must turn away from your fit, your family and the needy people and the travel, people who need your support, if you if you must turn away from them, your mercies. In other words, you can't afford to give them. A person comes to you and he needs help and you really can't help them. You don't have the money at this point or maybe you've spent somewhere else and you don't have extra for that. Tell them gentle words. That The English says gentle words. The word maysur, words made easy to be received. It's not qawlan yasira, which means easy words. Maysur, rendered easy. Because you're frustrated, right? People are asking you for help and you're frustrated. And it's very easy to say, you know, you're just, uh, you know, taking advantage of me, or whatever. But Allah is telling you, no. If you are not going to help them financially, if you're not going to help them materially, then tell them kind words or gentle words. Words that are easy to say and easy to be heard. People, when they ask for help, they have to in some way, lower themselves. So they, you should not take advantage of that and you should not tell, tell them harsh words. And finally, the last ayah today, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً عَلَىٰ عُنُقِكَ وَلَا تَبْسُطَهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْطُ فَتَقْعُدَ مَلُومًا مَحْصُورًا And do not make your hand chained to your neck. This is an expression in Arabic. It means that you are stingy. You don't spend any money. And in the Quran, Allah says, the Jews say that Allah's hand is tied to his neck, that Allah is stingy, he doesn't give. But Allah says, but rather his hands are extended. Here in this area, do not make your hand tied to your neck or chained to your neck, but also do not extend it all the way. 
In other words, don't be stingy, but don't be a spendthrift either. And then you will become blameworthy and in a state of loss. It says here insolvent. I suppose you could translate it as insolvent, but really mahsur, a person in a state of hasra, is when you're in a state of sorrow. It's like, what have I done? What has happened? You're in a state of sorrow, you're in a state of loss, not just financial insolvency. So this is an important expression here uh, because Allah is saying that you need to find a balanced way. Now, I assume that everybody on the call here, I mean, if you know anything about Islam, you know that we're always looking for the balanced way between the extremes. And when it comes to spending, you're looking for the balanced way between the extremes, whether it is spending in sadaqat and fitabilillah, or spending on yourself and your family on the good things of life that Allah allows us to partake in. Be balanced between the two and do not uh, go to one extreme or the other. So with this, inshallah, I conclude the uh, ayat that we mentioned today. In, uh, uh, in summary, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has addressed two subjects, but he also tied them. He interweaved two subjects, treating family well and being generous. And he did not separate them, but he's taking you to ihsan, through two forms of ihsan. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept and if there are any questions or comments, I'm happy to, uh, to take them. So, inshallah, the first question um, regarding the needs of the elderly parent. Yes. Needs can be divided into physical needs as well as the emotional needs. Yes. Can you give us a few words of advice on what are the emotional needs of the elderly parent, parents? Yes. And how can children better fulfill these emotional needs? Okay, so the Jazakallah khair for whoever asked the question because Allah is specifically talking both about physical and emotional need. When he says, don't say, oh, he's talking about emotional needs. Your parents deserve from you at any age, whether they are fit or whether they are weak, whether they're too old or whether they're in the prime of their age, they deserve from you respect. That's an emotional need. They deserve it from you. It's not simply that's a nice thing from you. They deserve that. But beyond that, they want your company. They want to hear from you. They want not to be abandoned. They want not to be forgotten. You now work in a different town and then you call them once a month. Frankly, that's not enough. Call them frequently. It doesn't have to be twice a day, but if you call them once or twice a week, it's very, very nice and it's very easy to put on a, on a schedule. But you will feel connected to them. They will feel connected to you. So that's one of the emotional needs. There is also another emotional need, the need for recognition. Your parents also deserve for you to recognize the favor that they have done upon you. Mention them and mention the good that they have done to you. If you've learned something from your mother, mention my mother taught me this, my father taught me that. That's part of what they deserve from you. The next thing that they deserve, especially as they get older, they become idle. They become sometimes bored. Sometimes they become irritable. Sometimes they become frustrated because they can't move like before. My grandmother, Rahimahallah, she was an extremely independent woman. She would travel into her 60s. She would travel all around the world by herself. And she was very, very independent. But when she got older, into her 70s, actually into her 70s, she was traveling. But in the later 70s and the early 80s, when she became so old, it became difficult for her to move. It was very tough. And she wanted company. She's, she, was, she was a woman of the world. She'd been to every place. She spoke four languages. And to be alone by herself, and then in the beginning, she could only walk short distances. And after that, she would be in a chair all day. And after that, she was in a bed all day. She deserves for her children to ask about her and visit her and spend time with her to remind her of all the things that she had done for them. This is part of the emotional need. The bottom line is, your parents deserve to be appreciated, but also they deserve for you to be there for them. Emotionally, not simply physically, but emotionally. My other grandmother, when she got old, one of the things that she loved the most, rahimahallah, is when uh, she used to live with us. When my father would ask for a shirt to be mended or for a, for a button to be added, because these are the times that she felt useful. The other time she felt that she was just sitting there or watching TV or 
Alhamdulillah, she was an avid Quran reader. So that's one thing that she did all day. But beyond being a Quran reader, she really didn't have much to fill her, her day. The fact that she feels appreciated and needed actually was very good for her. Each person is different. But don't uh, 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 underestimate the physical needs as well. Now, the emotional needs are more important in general than the physical needs, so long as the basic physical needs are fulfilled. But the physical needs, you know, Allah says, tells us in, uh, in the Quran, وَمَن نُعَمِّرْهُ نُنَكِّسْهُ فِي الْخَلْقِ أَفَلَا يَعْقِلُونَ Whoever reaches old age will become like a child again. Will they not think? So you have to help them in increasing ways. And you have to be patient with that because you have benefited from that when you were young. So uh, don't neglect the physical needs, but definitely be there for their emotional needs with asking about them, appreciating them, and also not allowing them to be abandoned, forgotten, or bored. Jazakallah khair, Brother Mazen. This is, you know, great advice, mashallah. Um, can you say a few words about the parents of your spouse? What obligations do I have towards them? And secondly, can I expect my spouse to do anything for my parents? Yes, Jazakallah khair. So uh, uh, there are two aspects. You know, when Allah uses words like ihsan, uh, he's go say, talking about beyond the minimum needed, right? So let me start talking about the haqq, the rights of the parents. Your parents have a right upon you above the rights of the parents of your spouse. But the parents of your spouse are part of your kin, part of your closest family. So after your parents, you know, it hardly gets any closer than, I mean, you have your parents, and then after that, in terms of elders, your spouse's parents come there. Uh, come, come next. So there is a general right for the parents of your spouse, but I know in some cultures it becomes overwhelming and there is a cultural expectation that goes beyond reasonable. So I'm not going to tell you where to draw the line. Each family sets it for their own. But I highly encourage the child to take the lead in taking care of their own parent and not just leave it to the spouse. So I have my parents, I don't just like, you know, leave my, uh, you know, everything that, all the birr to my wife and, uh, you know, my wife's parents are alive. She doesn't leave all the birr just to me and then, you know, she's missing in action. Uh, so you have to take care of your parents, uh, of, your, uh, of your parents first. And then come your spouse's parents, but just make it easy for your spouse to take care of those parents. Having said that, which is like the disclaimer, yes. Your spouse's parents have a right on you. They are, in a way, metaphorically, your other parents, especially in my case where my parents have passed away and my spouse's parents are still alive. And I, you know, I see closeness to Allah since I don't have parents by being good to my spouse's parents as much as I can. Uh, uh, so, so that's part of it. Within reason, you should take care of your spouse's parents. You should honor them. You should treat them well but they don't have the same haqq as your parents. I mean, the haqq of your parents is extraordinary in Islam. Right? The Messenger Sallallahu says, Anta wa maluka li abik. You and your wealth belong to your father. And the, the, the hadith here is applicable to father and mother. Okay? It doesn't go to that extent when it comes to your spouse's parents. So the haqq to the parents are so extraordinary, just extend some of it. Also, part of birrul walidain is that you treat their 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 um, their uh, their friends well after they have passed, but part of bitter to your spouse is that you treat her parents well or his parents well. I hope this uh, the question is answered. Exactly, like her. Um, oh, yeah. Inshallah, the next question is about uh, the adab of treating parents well at any age. So this. Specific here is that there was a rude teenager that was shouting at her parents, and yes. when she was corrected, she answered that this good treatment is specified for old parents in the Quran. Um, yes. Maybe her parents yes. were young. Um, yes. So, can you specify <laughs> what is the distinction between old parents versus young parents? Jazakallah khairan. 
uh, that, that's a funny interpretation. I, I would just direct the teenager to just read the ayah. That's all they have to do. Just read the ayah. Because Allah says, your Lord has decreed that you worship none but him and وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ أَحْسَانًا and good treatment for the parents. Period. Full stop. New sentence. If one of them or both reach old age, then do not say oh and do not mistreat them, but say the honorable words. I think the ayah explains itself. Uh, people like to just justify their bad manners. A person with minimum good manners will never find it within themselves to raise their voice against their parents or to mistreat their parents. This is so clear, so obvious in the ayah. All she has to do, just the first sentence from ayah 23. Uh, she or she, the teenager. Well, yeah. In some cultures, particularly back at home, um, there is an etiquette of asking permission of the parents to do things, even if you're a, a grown-up adult. Yes. Uh, this etiquette is more foreign in Western culture here today in America. Can yes. you say a few words about what we should be doing in terms of asking permission? What kind of things yes. should we be asking permission? Is this a good adab? Uh, and how can we yes. implement it? Jazakallah khair. Within reason, uh, it's, it's a good habit to, uh, to always ask for your parents' advice first. For the great things that uh, where they have much more experience than you do, then permission is a very, very good idea. It's a good adab. But it is not an Islamic mandate when you are an adult to ask for permission for everything. Now, specifically, a, uh, uh, the majority opinion, a young girl who's never been married before asks permission of her wali before marriage. But she doesn't have to ask an adult, young girl, right? She does not have to ask their permission for every little thing. Now, if the parents set clear rules, okay, she lives within those rules, but she does not have to ask permission for everything. The same with a young man. He does not have to ask permission for everything. Now, if they get married, then the girl does not have to ask her parents' permission for anything related to the marriage. She is now in her home. I'm saying this because there are family problems that arise when the parents interfere in the inner workings of a marriage. Not just the parents, anybody who interferes in the inner working of the marriage, they are more likely to spoil things than to make things better. Only people with good judgment, only wise people in the family can intervene in a marriage to make things better. So you do not have to ask permission for all sorts of things. It is a good habit in general, uh, but really the best habit is to ask for advice. If I look at what the Sahaba did, if I look at what uh, the messengers did, you can see that recorded in the Quran and the Hadith, you don't find them asking for permission for everything. Just so I'm not misunderstood, I'm saying it's a good habit. I'm just saying it's not necessary. So I'm not misunderstood. Okay. We talked a little bit about the traveler. Yes. And in today's world, you know, traveling is much easier than it was a long time ago. Yes. But as we are traveling, uh, whether we are traveling domestically by a train, New Jersey to Washington, you know, short kind of distances, are there particular things we should be trying to do more of in terms of a uh, good treatment towards travelers that we encounter on our journeys? JazakAllah khair. Even if the traveler is traveling first class, that displacement creates a little bit of confusion in their life it's a little bit of, it's troubling a bit. They ask the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, the fact that uh, uh, traveling used to be very hard, but it's easy now. Do we still continue to take the rukhsah? And the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, yes, it's a rukhsah from Allah, Allah loves that you take it. Back then, you had to travel over long distances, it took days and weeks. Now you have time zone differences. You have the fact that you don't have your own home anymore. So yes, the concept of taking care of the traveler continues but obviously how it gets dealt with is different back then you leave your your wealth at home 
You know, it's only the money that you brought. And if it runs out, it runs out and you're stuck. You're like a poor person, even though at home you're very rich. He, today we have credit cards. That's not really the need. But the need can be something different. The need can be simply finding, you know, a good companionship, uh, finding a place to stay. I personally, I'm a promo proponent of the idea that when Muslims travel and uh, they go to a place where there are other Muslims, in, whenever possible, it is nicer and better for them to stay in each other's homes than to stay in hotels all the time. This is only applicable among brothers who are close to each other and they have that understanding. It's also applicable to the one who's hosting. You don't impose yourself to somebody else's home. But I, I like that habit. And that would apply to Ibn Sabil in this case. He's traveling. You know, we're cooking a special meal for you. We're going to give you something really nice. We're going to give you a warm bed. You feel included and, and strong bonds develop just because of that. Jazakallah, Ken. And oh, yes. Inshallah, this will be the last question. Um, Inshallah. Can you leave us um, as participants in today's webinar with maybe three pieces of advice? Um, what should we as offspring do more of? You know, things that you see in the society that children are not doing enough of. You know, just three pieces of advice that we can take from today and st start to implement more in our lives. So I'm, I'm going to take essentially the three uh, uh, themes that stood out to me in this area as pieces of advice here. The first one, obviously, is to go out of your way to honor your parents, whether they're alive or passed away, to the point where you feel just a little bit ridiculous. Okay? Get yourself to the point where it feels a little bit too much. If you grew up without the habit of kissing the hands, start kissing the hands. I grew up without the habit of kissing the hands of my parents, and I wish I had done it more. I only started adopting the habit later in life, but you know they didn't live very long after that. Okay, so if you have, don't have the habit, do it. If they're living with you, just go to them today and just hug them and kiss them and say, you know, Mom, I truly appreciate everything you've done. No, just go out of your way to go a step extra in appreciating your parents because. Wallahi, yani, if just see how much heart you put into your own children. And if you don't have children, wallahi, you're in for a surprise. When you have your children, it's a whole other world. That's the first piece of advice. The second piece of advice is be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be grateful to your parents. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he who does not thank people does not thank Allah. And frankly, there are no people who did more for you than your parents, in the general case, of course. So... Be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and part of that gratefulness is to be grateful for your parents. And not saying here, go and tell them thank you. That's part of advice number one. I am saying recall the barakah, the blessing of having had parents. Be Allow your heart to be in a state of gratefulness to your parents and also to Allah for having given you those, those parents. That's the second piece of advice. The third piece of advice is this idea of moderation in the end. The ayat is focus, are focusing one way or another about material support, whether it's financial or giving people a meal or anything like this. this you know, it's just talking about being balanced. I want to take the general meaning of the, of the ayat. This idea of balance in all aspects of life, not to go to one extreme or the other, not to be a spendthrift and not to be miserly, not to spend all of your time on studies, don't spend all of your time on work. Don't spend all of your time on family, but have a balance between those things. A little bit of fun, a little bit of food, a little bit of Quran, a little bit. Balance your life out. The Sahaba were incredibly balanced. Now, this, some Sahaba were not balanced. And you actually have a hadith telling them to balance their lives out. So when a person says, I will never marry, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, I have more taqwa than you and I marry. And whoever does not want my sunnah is not of me. So seek out the balance. If something seems a little bit extreme or a little out of whack, then just be wary of it. Islam is naturally balanced. It doesn't need us to balance it, but it's naturally balanced. So these are three pieces of advice. Appreciate your parents. If they're alive, like today, go to them. If they've passed away in the other indirect ways, from dua to charity to honoring their friends. Secondly, 
be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be grateful to your parents. And thirdly, live a balanced life, which is the whole second half of the ayat that we read today. And I want to thank uh, ICNA for organizing this uh, program. I think it's a beautiful program. I'm always very, very happy when I participate. So jazakumullah khairan kathira. With that, we'll conclude. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu wa ilayk. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal asr. Inna l-insana la fi khusb. Inna al-lazina amanu wa amilu s-salihat. Wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Sadaqallahu al-lazim. As-salamu alaykum. Alaykum as-salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah